I do just now. Great. Okay. So we are live on Facebook. Um, I'm Jess Renke. I am the event director and property manager at the Donald and Carol Crest Pavilion. Um, I have Morgan Mann with me. She is the community relations director for Door County Libraries and is helping me run this meeting and has been an amazing help in all of these live programs we're doing. We appreciate everyone's patience. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Cal Kathrati. Uh, he is an award-winning winning, uh, underwater photographer, and um, he has been shooting for over a decade, and um, ha uh, this year has just shot his 100th dive, his 100th shipwreck. So with that, um, Cal, take it away. Uh, thanks a lot, Jess and Morgan, for all of your hard work in putting this together. It's just uh, really great fun to be able to escape for a few minutes and talk about shipwrecks. And also thank you to everybody who's tuned in and taken time out of your day to be with us today. Uh, this presentation is an overview of Great Lakes shipwrecks. We'll talk about how and why there are so many of them. And then after that, uh, I'd like to share some of my favorite photographs of 10 really interesting shipwrecks several of which are actually in Wisconsin waters. So for my fellow Wisconsinites that are tuning in today, that'll be a nice local connection. Uh, and then after that, I believe we've got some time set aside where I can take some questions from you, the viewers, regarding anything uh, underwater photography, diving, Great Lakes, shipwrecks, et cetera, et cetera. So with that being said, uh, I think we're just gonna dive right in. It really all started in July of 1679 when French explorer Robert LaSalle made history in a way that I'm pretty sure he never intended. He launched what would become the first ever shipwreck on the upper Great Lakes. And LaSalle's bark was a 45 ton wooden sailing ship named Griffin. He built it at the mouth of Cayuga Creek in Western New York. It's about three miles upriver from Niagara Falls, actually. So it was the, one of the first European built vessels on the Great Lakes. And only a few months later, when in mid-September, it left what is now known as Washington Island in Wisconsin's Door Peninsula on a fair summer day, it sailed off into the pages of history. Uh, the vessel, along with its cargo of furs, five cannon, and five crew, were never seen or heard from again. Now, the Griffin has yet to be positively identified or found, and though it's considered to be the first shipwreck in the Great Lakes, it sure wasn't the last. Since then, it's estimated that between six and 10,000 ships have made their way to the bottom of the Great Lakes. And they are a collective body of water so large that they represent 21% of the Earth's surf surface fresh water. They have indicative of their size several nicknames such as the Big Five and the Third Coast. And they're really considered to be more inland seas than they are lakes. Because of their, uh, they're, they're also so massive that they manufacture their own weather. And their storms can be just as deadly to man and ship as anything on the world's oceans. So traveling by boat on the Great Lakes during LaSalle's time was not to be taken lightly, and it wasn't to be taken lightly 150 years ago, nor today either. So maybe some of you are trying to process those numbers that I just talked about, between six and 10,000. That is a huge number. And what's causing all these vessels to sink? Why are there so many? Well, in order to understand some of the answers to these questions, you have to realize that in the 1800s, when the Midwest was really starting to expand, there was no interstate system and there were no semi-trucks. The roads were incredibly poor. 
the easiest, fastest, cheapest way to move people and goods was by ship. Nearly everything moved by way of lakes and rivers. There were literally thousands of vessels all going from A to B, this port to that port, and they're trying to do it as quickly as possible because time is money. And they're all taking pretty much the same routes from small schooners to big steamers. They're all getting constricted down into these choke points, geographic areas where they're maybe rounding a peninsula or something. So now you need to throw into the pot vicious summer squalls, oftentimes with hurricane winds and monster waves, uh, dense fog, and whiteout snowstorms. Add in an equal amount of uh, human error, captain's misjudgment, and of course, good old fashioned profit driven corporate greed. Stir that vigorously and top off with an icing of no GPS, no radar, and no weather forecasting, and in the early days, no radio either. And what you've got is a recipe for disaster, ships and lives lost. Whether it be ship to ship collision, or running aground, uh, fire, sinking from disrepair and neglect, massive waves, bad weather, ice, there are a lot of ways to sink a ship on the Great Lakes. And thus, over the decades, a museum of maritime history has been slowly assembled on the bottom of the Great Lakes. These archeological gems, each one virtually frozen in time, there are few comparable examples on dry land of sites that are so easily accessible and yet so undisturbed as is with a shipwreck. But divers are really fortunate because we oftentimes get to see these types of sites when we go down on a shipwreck. We get to see the everyday items that our ancestors used. That coffee pot that poured the last cup of hot joe before they lost their lives in cold water. Um, the stove that heated it, the dishes they ate their breakfast from the morning that they died, the hand tools that they made their living with for years, even the clothing they wore. In order for us to see these things though, we need to be able to get underwater and breathe underwater and man's been trying to do that effectively for literally hundreds of years through the use of various contraptions. And fortunately in 1943, another Frenchman by the name of Jacques Cousteau helped invent something called the demand regulator. And this was a device that significantly would increase bottom times and open the floodgates to what would become a new sport and ultimately a multi-billion dollar industry. Today, with even further advancements in technology, such as rebreathers, divers like my buddy here, Steve Weimer, can go deeper and stay longer than ever before and do it safely. And though I'm not a rebreather diver personally, one piece of equipment I rarely get in the water without is my camera rig because I'm passionate about photographing shipwrecks. It's probably the main reason I still dive in cold water today after all these years. So at this point, let's switch gears a little bit and let's take a look at some of the photographs I've taken with my cameras over the years of 10 shipwrecks that I feel really exemplify the grand diversity in maritime architecture on the bottom of the Great Lakes, while at the same time showcasing their sometimes just incredibly haunting beauty. So we're gonna start off in Lake Huron, actually Georgian Bay, which is a part of Lake Huron. It's on the Eastern side of Ontario's Bruce Peninsula. We're gonna to go to the steamer Manasu, which oddly enough, this, uh, these photographs are the last time I dove. This was July of last year. I'm embarrassed to say it's been that long, but apparently it has. And this is actually my hundredth shipwreck that I've seen in the world. So let's take a look at the Manasu. Let's take a look at the numbers. Uh, nearly 180 feet long, and it was lost in 1928. She had a pretty good service life, 40 years. 
went down in a storm. Now what happened was the mantis had been laid up for the season in September, put away for the winter, and was called out of layup uh, for one final run to bring a hundred plus head of cattle back from Manitoulin Island to the mainland. It was uh, the crew of 20 and the owner of the cattle who also loaded onto the vessel his one-year-old 1927 Chevy two-door coupe, which we're gonna be able to see as well. So they were 12 hours into their journey uh, way, uh, get, coming back from Manitoulin Island with the cattle when they encountered a storm. They began to list quite badly. And the next thing they knew, the vessel was on its side and within minutes it sank stern first in 200 feet of water. Now, six people managed to escape into a life raft. And those people remained in that life raft for two and a half days before they were finally rescued. They were near hypothermic. In fact, one of the six people did die prior to being picked up. Uh, but the people who survived were the captain, the owner of the cattle and the car, and three crew. So let's take a look at the Manasu. This vessel is unique. It was just found a couple of years ago by Jerry Elias and Chris Cole and Ken Merriman. It's unique because it has wooden superstructure like the pilot house here, which is still intact and on the vessel. Usually those wooden parts of the vessel will blow off as built up air pressure pushes them off when the vessel sinks. It didn't happen in this case. And it also has this unique uh, midship stairs coming down. Just a really cool feature. And if you look here at my cursor, uh, the wheel is in the inside the pilot house still. Let's take a closer look. Let's look right through this window here at what's inside there. There's that wheel with the black and red paint still on it. And in the foreground, we have a gimbaled compass. And on the wall, right by the entry door, you can't see it real well here, but you can see it here, is a clock still hanging. The hands have rusted away, but uh, this is some really, really great stuff. This, this is pretty rare to, to see this kind of stuff. Another neat feature of this shipwreck, it had four lifeboats when it sailed. One is sitting on the lake bottom near the stern. One is crushed underneath the fallen smokestack. And the other one is in our foreground here. And if you look at the detail, somebody had handwritten the length, the beam, the depth, and some other measurements on the bow of that wooden lifeboat. Some cool details. Here's that 27 Chevy Coupe that I was talking about, and my dive buddy Steve is photographing it and lighting it up, looking through one of the side cargo hatches where they would have loaded all the cargo in. Here's a closer look of that car, and there's Steve inside lighting it up. If you look on the, the grill of the car, that Chevy bow tie emblem is still, just like the day it was made, still pretty new. Fantastic to see something special like that still in there. They suspect that the vessel probably accumulated a, a heavy list in the storm due to the 100 plus head of cattle breaking the makeshift pen and all shifting to one side of the vessel and then causing it to become unstable and not be able to rewrite itself. That's, that's the general thought. So let's stay in Lake Huron and move up to Tobomori, Ontario, which is a diver hotspot, has been for decades. We're going to go look at probably the one of the finest wrecks in Tobomori, the Bark Arabia. Unfortunately, this is one vessel that we just don't have a picture of before it sank. Uh, sometimes it happens. You know, cameras were not prolific back in the mid and late 1800s as they are today, obviously. But it was a two-masted sailing ship. It was of medium size, about 130 feet long. And it was also fairly long in the tooth when it encountered a storm. It was uh, bringing corn from Chicago and they were nearly to their destination in Midland, Ontario when they got caught in a storm and the story has it that the crew actually manned the pumps to try and keep water out of the, the bilge for 18 hours before they finally gave up and they got in the lifeboat. There were no deaths on this wreck, thank goodness, uh, and there was also some horses on board and they swam to nearby Echo Island where they ended up living out the rest of their lives and it is now known as Horse Island.
So here is that grand schooner. Um, it, it, I believe, was on the bottom 100 years in 1984 or 85. So she's been down there a lot. It's got two beautiful woodstock anchors still at the cat heads, a beautiful bowsprit and jib boom. Let's take a look at the port side of that. And here we can see one of her masts lying on that port rail. A closer look at the beautiful trestle tree, or what people think of as a crow's nest on that mast, and also the windlass, which is what was used to lower and raise the anchors, and the anchor chain still attached. This wreck's got a lot of rigging blocks and dead eyes on it, uh, which are always really interesting to see. We'll take another closer look at those anchors. Here's that port anchor up close. Just massive uh, iron and wood anchors. Now this has got a, a centerboard trunk. That's what we're looking at here in this photo. And this is a giant, beautiful rigging block attached there. And we can see the mast on the left side going off up towards the bow. The stern of this vessel isn't quite in as good a condition as the bow. When she sank, she probably hit stern first and it was quite broken up. And part of that after deck in the helm and the steering gear has fallen off to the side and onto the bottom of the lake. That's what we're looking at here was the wheel. And my friend Steve Weimer is lighting that up. And here is a stone commemorative plaque that was placed in 1985 to commemorate the century of it being on the bottom. That's a great wreck, a lot of fun, about 110 or 120 feet deep. We're going to switch gears and go over to the big lake they call Gichigumi. We're going to go to Isle Royale, uh, the southwestern end of it, and we're going to take a look at the propeller Henry Chisholm. This one went down uh, before the turn of the century. It was a pretty good sized freighter, wood, wood hold freighter. It got, it had just left Duluth and it got caught in a storm and it was towing a consort. It was towing a barge with more cargo in it as was very common in those days. And when they cut it loose in the storm so that it would not become a detriment to their own health and safety. And after the storm, they spent two days running around looking for the consort they had cut loose. And when they tried making port, they ran aground on a rock reef, which is pretty common in that part of Lake Superior. Uh, so when the vessel hit the reef, it was there for about a week and they salvaged a bunch of things off of it. And then another storm came along and broke it up and put it on the bottom. So this is what's left of the stern. We're looking at a profile shot of the stern here and it's propeller and propeller shaft. This is about 140 feet deep. Notice there are no zebras or quaggas here. That's because Superior is the last of the five lakes to become inundated with them. Here's my buddy Scott Bross uh, standing on the bottom of the lake as he oftentimes would. And he's looking at the missing one and a half prop blades. And that's what happens when steel and stone meet. Stone always wins. So the engine to this large wooden freighter was a twin or a, a double compound steeple steam engine. And it's a massive piece of iron about two and a half stories tall. This is the base of it and the transmission that would have gone off to the prop shaft and the prop at the back of the boat is here on the left. If we slide a little higher up, we're about 25, 20 feet off the bottom of the lake here. You can see the intricate workings of this massive engine that powered this freighter. It's just a, a wonderful piece of equipment. Uh, Dirk and Heiko are floating around it. Here's a close up of the ironwork. If you look here, you can see detailing in the ironwork that has nothing to do with structural integrity or mechanical uh, anything. It, it's just simply decorative. This is, comes from a time when things were made, when people cared about what they were making and what it looked like. And the fact that we have no zebra or quagga mussels to cover that up is just wonderful. This is a four image mosaic, meaning I had to take four separate photographs and digitally stitch them together in order to get one impossible shot. And I say that impossible shot because 
the visibility in the water would not have allowed me to get far enough away to gather this entire 30 foot tall steam engine in one shot. But this is what it looks like. And it's associated debris field around it on the bottom. So that's the Chisholm. We're gonna go a little bit, uh, just a little ways up the, the island to the Chester Condon. We're still at Isle Royale National Park, a great hot spot for shipwrecks. They have lots of wrecks up there for divers. Here's the numbers on the, uh, on the Condon. This was a big freighter, a steel hulled freighter, over 500 feet long, and it too ran aground on the rocks. Uh, it was very common, a lot of rock reefs up there. It was on the reef for two days before another storm came and pummeled it and uh, put it on the bottom. And incidentally, this was the first loss on Lake Superior to be valued over a million dollars. So what happened with this was the storm came along, broke her in two, and the head or the bow broke off, slid down one side of the reef, the rest of the vessel slid down the other side of the reef. So I, when I was there, did not get a chance to dive the uh, back half of the boat, but I dove the bow, which is just surreal because it's sitting on an angle on the reef, looking back up towards the surface, wondering where the rest of it is. It's just, it's fantastic. And this is a lot of fun to dive as well because you can penetrate inside, you can crawl through the rooms and the corridors and get into the pilot house. On the right here, we see some large twisted metal. When these things go down and they, they really twist up and they become mangled oftentimes. So this is the Chester Condon, a wonderful large steel freighter. We're going to stay in Lake Superior for the Bermuda, but we're going to go over to Munising in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Munis, uh, the Bermuda was a wooden sailing ship and it actually sank twice. So the story goes there were there was two feet of water in the bilge when it loaded iron ore in Marquette. Didn't get very far. By the time it got to Munising, it was fighting a pretty bad storm. It had sprung some more leaks and it was filling with water. It got out of the storm into Munising Bay to, to just get safe harbor. And during the night it sank and took three of its crewmen with it. Uh, I believe they were trapped in the bow when it went down. It stayed on the bottom of Munising Harbor for 13 years until it was raised and towed to nearby Grand Island where uh, in Murray Bay of Grand Island, it fell out of its lifting straps, landed on the bottom in 25 feet of water and that's where it rests today yet. It's very shallow, as I said, about 25 feet of water. It's great for the glass bottom boat tour boats. Uh, they can take non-divers or non-snorkelers over the top and you can see the decks quite easily. The day that I shot these photographs, we were there shortly after a tour boat. So their prop wash had mixed up a lot of the sand and silt from the bottom of the lake. And the water kind of got this really neat sort of misty, foggy, turbid look to it. This is my friend Reason Pilot demonstrating how easy it is uh, to free dive. Here's Steve again on the bow. It looks like the thing's just coming out of a mist like a ghost ship. And again, because no zebras or quaggas, the wrecks in Lake Superior are so wonderful to dive on because you can see the details in the wood and how they fit the pieces together. And you can see the, the smaller objects quite clearly and you can tell what everything is. The picture on the uh, left is taken from inside the cargo hold, looking up through some of those cargo hatches and some missing boards on the deck. And the picture on the right is the leading edge of the bow. And you can just see that wood still after all these years in pretty good condition. And I believe this is probably the bow sprit laying on the bottom in front. <clears throat> Final parting picture of the Bermuda. This is no tech and, and high tech diving on the massive rudder. You can see how thick that wood rudder is uh, at the back of the Bermuda. So we're going to leave Superior and come right down next to you, actually, uh, Jess and, and Morgan. And we're going to look at the Frank O'Connor, 
which is off of Bailey's Harbor, uh, a little bit north of Cana Island Light, if you know where that is. So this vessel is unique because at 301 feet long and being wood, it really pushed the limits of wooden boat building. Uh, they used iron straps called hogging in order to achieve even this length, but this was about as big as they ever got. And this particular vessel was carrying 3,000 tons of coal the night it caught fire. They're 10 miles offshore and the captain decided to make a run for shore and beach it, but before he got there, two miles shy of his destination, the steering gear burned through. It ended up burning all night long and could be seen for quite some distance. And story has it that the lighthouse keeper from Cana Island Light came out in his power boat and was able to pull the survivors. Uh, no one per uh, perished on this wreck either, thank goodness. They were in their lifeboats and he pulled them away from the burning wreck with his power boat. So the first thing you may notice at this photograph is the water is really green. And no, I did not change it to look like that. That's what it looked like the day that Steve and I dove it. Um, it was probably a lot of algae bloom but the stern of the vessel is still fairly unique because it shows this massive 12 foot diameter prop. It used to turn at 85 RPMs and it was powered by a ginormous um, three uh, triple expansion steeple steam engine similar to the, to the Chisholm engine that we looked at earlier. The thing in the foreground here with the prop is actually the rudder laying on the lake bottom. So here's that triple expansion steam engine. Again, sitting nearly three stories tall off the bottom of the lake. And it was powered by two Scotch boilers, which can be seen here in this photograph. And if you make that long football field of a swim up to the bow, um, there's not a lot of structure to the wreck left, but there is a large pile of anchor chain and a really nice anchor. So that is the Frank O'Connor. Now we're gonna slide down Wisconsin shoreline a little bit to Two Rivers. And we're gonna visit probably the most famous shipwreck in Lake Michigan, the Ralph Simmons, which is also known as the Christmas tree ship. So that was a three masted wooden schooner, uh, very long in the tooth, 44 years old when she went down in a storm in 1912. And this was probably about the end of the sailing era, uh, excuse me, era on the Great Lakes for commercial vessels. No one survived, unfortunately. Uh, she was bringing a load of Christmas trees from the UP to Chicago, where Captain Scheunemann and his brother would sell them direct to the public right off the deck, and it'd become a Chicago tradition that folks used to look forward to every year. And of course, one year, uh, the Rouse Simmons just never made it, never showed up. She was loaded with 5,500 Christmas trees uh, when she left on that final fateful voyage. It's about 165 to 170 feet of water. And what's really cool about this wreck and this dive in these photographs is this is the best visibility I have ever seen on any Great Lakes dive since or before. Uh, before about 140 feet of clear water visibility on this. This is what I saw coming down the line. Now the vessel itself, the hull is intact, uh, but all the deck boards are gone or rotted away and the masts are all laying on the lake bottom. It's not in the best condition. There's a lot of other schooners in the Great Lakes that are in better condition than the Ralph Simmons, but the pedigree makes this wreck an absolute must see at least once for, for Great Lakes divers. One of the cool things about this is you can still see part of her cargo. Look at the little Christmas trees laying in the hold here, as well as the windlass on the bow. Here's another shot of a Christmas tree. Stories have it that for years, uh, things were coming up in fishermen's net, and that's uh, the wallet of the captain, I believe, was actually found in a fisherman's net not long after the wreck uh, went down. Also, trees would come up occasionally. Here's some of her masts. When she struck the bottom, 
suspected that she struck bow first and the mast would have either de-stepped or broke and all fallen forward onto the lake bottom. There's my favorite image from that, from that shoot. I mean, look at the visibility. It's a 124 foot long ship and I'm 15 feet in front of it and I can see the back. That's, that's just incredible. I don't even get visibility like that in Cozumel. One parting shot of the Ralph Simmons. So we're gonna move on to something much more modern than a 1912 wreck like the Ralph Simmons. We're gonna go see the Prince Willem V, which is a modern day wreck. She went down in 1954, just a few miles. Actually, it's what happened was, it was a mile and a half out of Milwaukee's Harbor when it struck a barge of bunker fuel or, or, or oil being towed by a, tow, uh, by, by a, um, a towboat. A tugboat. It, they never saw the barge. It was at night. They had functioning radar on this vessel. It's a modern modern vessel. They just didn't have it turned on. So when they struck the barge, it put a fateful hole in the hull, and then it bounced and it came and hit it a second time. Put a second hole in. She began taking on water, and uh, she was on the bottom in an hour and a half. Now there were thirty souls aboard. Everybody thankfully got off without. Any, uh, any loss of life. They were put up for the evening at the Pfister Hotel in Milwaukee, which is a wonderful, fantastic hotel. But this sank in, in 80 feet of water, and it has just a wonderful story because it was built in Rotterdam in the Netherlands during the early 40s, and when World War II came to Holland's doorstep and the Germans appropriated the country, the German army actually took over possession of this vessel, which was not completed yet. And a few short years later, when the Allies liberated Holland, the retreating army, uh, German army, dynamited the Prince Willem V and put it on the bottom of Rotterdam Harbor, where it ended up staying for a few years until it was raised and then refitted and finally finished. It was only in service for five years when it finally sank in Milwaukee. It was a big deal. It was all, all the newspapers and television news. Anyways, if you stand at the very bow, at the very front, and you look down the ship, this is what you see. Uh, it's laying pretty heavily on its right or starboard side. And in the distance, we see one of her two cargo loading cranes. There's another shot showing uh, from a little higher up showing some of the workings on the bow, and that crane, we got some divers in here for scale. And you can see off on the right, the clay cliffs that the currents, that the water moves around the hull, sort of carve out those, those cliffs from the bottom of the lake. Here, Dirk Wilhelm is lighting up the front of the pilot house windows, and we see the smokestack right here. Now we're at the back of the smokestack and Dirk is uh, demonstrating where the engine skylight is. This is a six windowed skylight that was directly above the engine for the vessel. And you can actually crawl through these uh, areas here if you don't have too many tanks on you. And you can go in about 15 or 20 feet where I know Brian is watching and Brian is also in this photograph shining his light on the top of this five cylinder heads of this five cylinder diesel engine that powered the vessel inside the bowels of the ship. Uh, interestingly enough, when we crawl inside these vessels for interior shots, there's a lot of silt and one single errant fin kick can kick up a, a massive cloud and turn what looks like otherwise clear water into uh, just, just a whiteout, and that's exactly what happened to us. I came in through that skylight with all my gear and my big camera, and I brought in a whole cloud of silt, which enveloped us about two seconds after this photograph was taken. <laughs> so we were lucky to get it. Anyways, uh, here's Brian and I coming out of one of the cargo holds. You can see these 55 gallon drums on the bottom here. This is part of its original cargo. It had left Milwaukee with, among other things, printing presses, lawnmowers, 
uh, and typewriters, animal byproducts, and tin residue. And I suspect that these 55 gallon drums were probably holding a lot of the byproducts from the meat, uh, rendering process and rendering plants in Milwaukee. Also right here is a large rubber pontoon that was uh, uh, inflatable rubber pontoon that was uh, used in an attempt, one of several attempts to raise this vessel in the late 50s from the bottom of the lake. Obviously it was not successful. So here is another impossible shot of a 258 foot long steel freighter all in one photograph at the bottom of Lake Michigan. This is probably the single most photograph I'm most proud of that I've ever taken. It's actually 55 still photos digitally stitched together uh, by hand to create this one image. And there's some divers in the photo here for scale reference. There's a couple back here by the aft cargo hatches as well as some up front. Wonderful dive, I've been on it more than 50 times. Uh, it, it's it's uh, easy to get to, it's three and a half miles east of Milwaukee's Harbor, it's in 80 feet of water. Might be the most dive shipwreck in all the Great Lakes due to all these accessible features and the fact that it's so well intact and fun to crawl through. And you can go down the hallways and into the rooms. So now we're going to go back a little bit in time. We're going to look at an older steamer, the St. Albans, also out of Milwaukee, but a few, few miles further offshore. Uh, this is a packet steamer that used to take people and goods back and forth between Milwaukee and Ludington, Michigan. And it left Milwaukee to go to Ludington one day and it struck some ice, put a hole in the bow. They started taking on water. They realized it, they turned around, they tried making it back to Milwaukee, and obviously they didn't, or we wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, sank in about 165, 170 feet of water. Everybody got into the lifeboats, and as the story goes, with some difficulty, made it all back to shore eventually, because they were several miles offshore. But unfortunately, a mother cow and her calf did not survive the ordeal. Steve Weimer is demonstrating some amazing visibility here. This is probably 80 feet of visibility. Um, we're at the bow, looking towards the back of the vessel. She's fairly broke up in the front. There's a large section just after the bow where she's almost just cut in half. But the really cool thing about this wooden shipwreck is its immense debris field. There's just so much stuff all over the lake bottom. It really shows what happens to vessels sometimes when they hit the bottom. Now we're at the back of the shipwreck at the stern looking forward. Um, and here Steve is hovering uh, in front of this fallen smokestack. On the left here on the deck, we see a capstan, which would have been used for winching in mooring lines and things of that nature. And then the steam engine and boiler that powered it. Again, look at this debris field here. And I know Steve's watching right now, um, and I just want to point this out because he hates it when I do this. He would have gotten great photographs of this shipwreck too had he realized before he took his camera underwater that the batteries were dead. So this little item right here on the deck is Steve's camera sitting there, uh, unable to take really great photographs on a great dive of great visibility. <laughs> I know, Steve. I'm sorry, buddy. I had to point that out. So here's the bow on the left and the stern on the right. Um, that prop and rudder is what he's shining his light at here. Just a great dive, a nice technical dive. It's a little bit beyond the depths for recreational diving, um, but always a good time. So we're going to talk about our final 10th wreck this is the car ferry milwaukee it's a favorite of divers in this area because uh, it's 120 feet deep and it's got some really cool features this was a very large vessel well not very large but fairly large 340 feet long steel ship and its sole intention really was to move railroad cars from one side of the lake to the other because back in the late 1800s the rail yards in Chicago were very congested and it took sometimes weeks to get a car through 
uh, from say Minnesota through the railroads in Chicago over to Michigan or points east. And so sooner or later, some companies realized it was profitable to actually load 25 or 30 of these things on a boat, take them across the lake, and in two days they could be they could be where it would have taken two weeks had they gone through Chicago. So the car ferry Milwaukee's job was to take rail cars back and forth. And on the day that it sank in 1929, which oddly enough was about a week before the big market crash the, that began the um, the what's the word I'm looking for? You know, the whole uh, Dust Bowl years and the depression uh, of the 30s. It sank in a, in a wicked storm. They had come across from Michigan in the morning. They were in Milwaukee. Some of the crew thought that the vessel was going to hold up in port like all the other vessels had because of the storm. And some of them went into town, went to see a movie. The captain blew the whistle saying, We're getting ready to leave to the you know, to the surprise of some of the crew who didn't make it back. The vessel left Milwaukee. The last person to ever see it alive, besides the people on board, was the light station, uh, the light boat keeper, who saw it pitching heavily in the seas. We found out from a message that was written and put in a uh, watertight capsule after the vessel went down that uh, they had tried to turn around and make it back to Milwaukee, thinking that uh, that was the safest thing, and they just obviously didn't make it. All hands were lost. About 46 folks perished when this went down, and there were 25 rail cars on board. It's a large steel-hulled vessel sitting on the bottom, as you can see, as Dirk and Mike Crone are swimming past the bow here. And then also in this photograph, there's a line, a rope that's attached to the vessel here, and it kind of runs off to the right. And we're going to take a look at what that's attached to in just a minute. So here's a shot of the stern looking straight at it from the bottom of the lake. You can see the rails that the rail cars would have rolled onto the deck with. And this large mangled piece of metal right here is what's known as the Seagate. It was a metal door that would have come down once the cars were loaded to keep water from splashing up onto the deck and it, it was mangled like a tin can in that storm. One of the really cool features about this wreck is if you go all the way to the bottom of the lake at 120 some feet and you look underneath the starboard stern, this is the starboard prop shaft, it had two propellers. The starboard prop and prop shaft is sitting right on top of a wheel set, a truck uh, is what they call it, from a rail car. So obviously it fell to the bottom of the lake and then the ship settled on top of it. And this is, uh, again, Brian Bockholt showing his light, uh, shining his light on that prop shaft. This is a straight on shot of the bow. Brian is lighting up the hoss hole where the anchor chain would have gone through. And then we're gonna take a look at what that line was attached to. When this thing went down about 80 uh, feet away, the pilot house uh, blew off due to built up air pressure like we were talking about earlier, and it settled on the bottom of the lake, not far from the vessel. And there's a line because sometimes visibility is bad and you can't see one from the other. And so you follow that line out there. But here my buddy Cameron Wilson is shining his light on the pilot house and he had also been kind enough to set one of my off-camera lights inside there for us so that we could get a really cool shot. So those are 10 of my favorite picks that exemplify shipwrecks and their great diversity throughout the lakes. This is a map showing uh, all the wrecks that I've been on in the Great Lakes and hopefully I've got a lot more to add to it. But at this point, I'd love to open this up to questions. Uh, Cal, I'm just going to share a few comments that came in um, via Zoom, and then Morgan's been monitoring Facebook. So um, we have uh, we have some comments on Zoom. Um, we will have this full recording uh, pu published on Facebook afterwards. About two minutes in, we ended up it got cut off for some reason, so we've now. Um, 
got the whole thing, we'll put it online afterwards, but we were able to recover from that. Um, we have 54 people on right now, which is the most we've ever had for any program. And I think that speaks to how amazing your work is and we really appreciate it. Um, one of the comments that came in, Killer Shot Cal from Eric Patop, Petkovic. Sorry, Eric, if I butchered your name. <laughs> Nicely done, says Terry Irvine. Um, Tina Lapree says amazing work. Um, NMI Rex says what a viz. Maybe that's... Thank you, Ross one. Richardson. Yes. And then um, Jeff Britnell says, oh, snap, Stephen. I think that was regarding the... the <laughs> That was the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lens, and then somebody says, I don't know who me is, but it says it's either the, either the batteries or the lens cover with the camera already in the housing. Um, I'm sorry, then, could you repeat that, Jess? Um, I don't know who me is, but it says it's either the batteries or the lens cover with the camera already in the housing, smiley face, wink. Oh, yeah, those are, those are the common things that underwater photographers usually do once. And, and then, then they don't do again. And then John Galbraith says, great photography, Cal. And then Jet says, a splendid presentation, Cal. And then, um, and then Mike Nace says, everyone needs some of Cal's photography to hang on their wall at home. Nice. And, nice. and uh, Frank says, terrific pics. Any other wrecks around Cana Island? He asks, because he's a volunteer tractor driver there. OK. Um yeah, there are other wrecks in that area. I've not got any personal experience with them, uh, but there are a number of good books written by authors such as Chris Cole that uh, that you can pick up online that will tell you where they are and which ones are, are good for diving. And I'm, I'm, I'm always learning too. You know, I've been on a lot of wrecks, but that's a lot more I haven't been on. So I'm, I'm always learning just like everybody else where, where the next cool wreck is that I haven't seen. Very cool. And Morgan, do you have any Facebook questions before we open it up to everyone on Zoom and they can converse? Sure. Um, the only, um, Jill says, this is one of my favorite dives relating to the Chisholm engine. And a lot of very interesting, love the shots. Um, Gail had a question, um, and I think it was on the St. Albans one. Um, she mo mentioned that she had heard that the barrels were part of the attempt to salvage. The barrels? Correct. So it's hard. Oh, but it's oh the Prince Willem. So, uh, as far as I know, there was never an attempt to salvage the St. Albans. The uh, Prince Willem freighter was uh, several attempts to salvage it in the late 50s by a Milwaukee native by the name of Max Jean Knoll, who was kind of a local legend, a diving legend uh, in his own time. He had actually set the world's depth record at 420 feet in uh, 1939, I believe off of Port Washington in basically homemade dive gear and on mixed gas. So a, he, he tried to attempt it. Those 55 gallon drums were part of the cargo. They, they were not part of the, uh, there was on one attempt, a lot of rubber pon army pontoons that were being used to try and float it, which failed miserably. And on another attempt, they had four large steel caissons that were about 40 feet in length and 10 feet in diameter that were strapped by steel cable to the vessel and they were gonna blow those dry and use those to lift it off the bottom. And that failed as well. Obviously there, were, there was three, no less than three attempts to raise this vessel and it's obviously all failures because it still sits on the bottom today. But uh, that those 55 gallon drums, Gail, uh, were part of the cargo. And Dean Nolan says that he thinks that's right on the barrels, he commented on Zoom. Um, just a couple more Zoom typed questions and I'll open it up. Um, Ralph says, most excellent, curious about the pictures mostly being void of fish life. Are the wrecks just too deep to act as fish shelters or why is that? Do you know? No, they're definitely not too deep to act as fish shelters. Unfortunately, I think it's a matter of a, a couple factors. A, I think there's fewer fish in the lakes than there were 30 or 40 years ago when the water was less clear. Um, 40 years ago, 
before quaggas and zebras invaded the water, you would never have gotten photographs like the kind that I get nowadays because the water just, you know, if you could see six or seven or eight feet in front of you, that was really good. That was good visibility. And so there was a lot more places for young fish to hide in the water column. There's fewer places now. Uh, the fish also don't like our bubbles as divers, and so they're gone long before we get there. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a matter of, I think, fewer fish, and they just don't want to be around us. That's why we never see them. We see burbots, these little things that sort of sit on the bottom. They're lazy, and they kind of, I don't know, not really nice looking fish. They don't hover in the water. They just sit on the bottom. We see those once in a while. That's about it. Cool. And then the Sorry. last question before we can all talk freely. So what are you using for stitching software and how long did it take for the larger stitching? That's from Gary, Gary L E. Gary, that's a fantastic question. I don't use stitching software because I have, and I've had this discussion a few times with people. I've never found anything that can do it perfectly. And so I have to do it by hand. And I use a Photoshop-esque program. I used to use Photoshop. I, I now use something called Affinity Photo, which is very similar, but it's open source. Uh, and I stitch everything by hand just because it, no program can deal with the nuances of underwater photography as well as you can by just doing it by yourself. It, it takes a long time. It's not, so if it's not something you want to do if you only have a few minutes. I mean, it, it, that 55 still images of the Prince Willem took weeks to do and hundreds and hundreds of layers. But in the end, that's the only way to get a perfect shot. Great okay, question. I'm, uh, I'm going to unmute everybody. Oh, and so. um, and I, yeah, first I shared, yeah, I'm going to put your tooth in it. Hey, well, I'll mute everybody. I'll we'll go get one and I'll bring it upstairs to you. Oh. oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, maybe that was a little bit too crazy to have everybody unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was insane. Yeah. Well, you know, we give it a shot. So, does anyone have any other questions? Oh, does anyone, if you have something that you want to ask, um, try to use the raise hand function? Great idea. Morgan, do you know where they would find that on their browser? Or wave your hand, actually. Anybody, any questions? Nobody has any questions? Come on, guys. I know that there's there's some folks out there that... Hey, Cal, wonderful job, Cal. Thanks, buddy. Nice to see you, Kim. Very you. nice. Hope Thank you, you Carol. Out. Hope to see you out on the lake this summer. I hope so, man. Oh. Okay, so Michelle Lucking, she's giving me the thumbs up. Do you, Michelle, do you have a question? No, just great job. Thank you, Michelle. Nice to hear from you again. Hey, Cal. Hi. Jonathan, Jonathan do you have any comments? It's just so good yeah, was... to see this presentation come through after all the hard work you've done. So thank you, Jess and Egg Harbor Library and Cal. So great that we could continue this to happen. Thank you, Tina. And it was a big connection that you made with the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society and the Crest, and it's been a great relationship. So I really appreciate it. Uh, I, would, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society is an absolutely phenomenal resource for anyone that's interested in vessels, especially prior to sinking, uh, in their history, photographs, and things of that nature. I am a uh, board trustee, as is Tina, and we can, I think, both agree that um, more people should should be aware of the phenomenal library that we have. It's how the collection is housed in the Milwaukee Public Library downtown. And, um, and it's just a wonderful group of people who are passionate about protecting our maritime history and preserving it for generations to come. Wouldn't you agree, Tina? Absolutely. And uh, just to say that Cal, surprisingly, is our shipwreck ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you'd like to see more of this or see Cal's portfolio, um, I'm sure you wouldn't mind you reaching out to him or you could connect with the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society and we can 
forward you to him. Absolutely, yeah. All, right. all, all my photographs are available if anybody saw anything that they need to hang on their wall. I know Mike Nace made a, made a nice comment earlier about my artwork. Um, my, my photos are all available at calsworld.net and uh, you can get prints in any type and size you like of any of these photographs if ev any of them resonate with you. Okay, Cal, we're going to kind of go down the list. So Jonathan, sorry, did you have something you wanted to say to Cal? Do you have a question? Yeah, just uh, I, I think I had noticed that um, it looked like uh, probably in most of your dives, you're uh, diving uh, with dry suit, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm way too old for a wetsuit in the Great Lakes. That water is any, depending on the time of year, anywhere from, you know, 36 to 44 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and and I, I don't want to be cold anymore. So yeah, dry suit, dry gloves. Absolutely. And I wear, I wear a heated vest now in the spring. <laughs> and I use argon too, which is a, a thicker suit gas, right? So uh, you're able to insulate a little better than if you're just using air in your suit. Um, and then Brian, um, you had a question. I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just had one quick comment. So um, Cal, great presentation. And I know I've seen your, because uh, I'm, I'm at Aquatic Adventures up in Brookfield too. I've seen your poster up there with your multiple pictures of different vessels. So is, is that a portion of, I mean, you're like your selected few best or? Um, that poster is a uh, fairly recent. I just came up with that about a year ago. Uh, that is just something I put together. It's not, uh, it's, it's not like every shipwreck I've ever dove. Unfortunately, I've not photographed every shipwreck I've ever dove. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's probably the best of the best. And it's just sort of a nice way to celebrate shipwrecks. I think there's probably, uh, what, about 60 or 70 pictures on that poster. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, and they're available at calsworld.net too, folks. Yeah, I haven't purchased my own copy yet, but I intend to, and it, it, excellent job. So thank you much. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for joining, Brian. Okay, the next question is from Terry Quinn. I loved it. This is a wonderful program. Thank you so much, Cal. Did I hear you say you were going to have a repeat of this on, on Facebook? I'm thinking of somebody who didn't make it. Yeah, so, well, well, Terry, we'll have our, the whole video posted on the Door County Library's Facebook page and the Crest Pavilion page. Um, and okay. then we'll be sure to get Cal the link for that so that he could send it out to whomever he'd like as well. So wonderful. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Dean, did you have something? Yeah, um, as far as Door County, are there any charters operating up there now? Uh, I had a hard time finding one the day I dove the Frank O'Connor because I live in Milwaukee. I don't, I don't dive up there that often and I don't have my own boat, but, um, there's none that I know of that I can tell you about right now. Uh, but I would imagine, I, you know what, send me an email, Dean, and I'll, and I'll try yeah. it see if I can't find something out for you. Yeah, this is great. It's been a while since I've actually dove up there and there's some great wrecks up there. It, yeah, where where are you from? I'm in I'm in the Chicago area. Oh, you're in Chicago area. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a long way to go without something locked in the books. And there's a lot of really great shore dives up there too. You know, you shore dive in Chicago yeah. or Milwaukee, you can't get deep. You can't get more than 25 feet deep if you swim 400 yards offshore. But up there, you can swim 50 yards offshore and be in 80 feet of water. It's just the bottom topography is so different, right? So. Uh, there's great shore dives to be had up there, but as far as wreck diving, um, I'll see what I can do, but get in touch with me privately about that. All right. Um, and then there's a question, a last question that someone typed. Oh, um, Frank says Shoreline does charters for diving. Frank okay, great. Said that. They're doing it now because they did it years and years ago, and then they didn't, and I don't know. And I know Kathy was up there for a while, but you know, I know she stopped doing that, and I know she passed away. So, out uh, of Gills Rock, but uh, yeah. I, I didn't know Shoreline was doing it again. Yeah, I didn't know Shoreline was still in business, so. Um, and then a uh, question here, Cal, what wreck that you haven't do dove yet would you most like to photograph? photograph? That's from NMI Rex. <laughs> uh, great question, Ross. Um, 
I probably the next one. I don't know. I, there's just so many, you know, there's just so many wrecks as we talked about earlier in the show. I mean, there's thousands and, and it's just a question of time and money. So, um, as you can see by this map, do we still have this map up, uh, uh, yep. Jess? Yeah, okay. it should be. So, if you're, let's, let me just take a look and make sure it looks like we're, you're still sharing your screen. Of okay. Um, so this map, you can see I've peppered the five Great Lakes as best I can uh, due to time and money being located down in Milwaukee. And um, there are obviously hot spots where there are a lot of wrecks and that's where you try and go so you can get a bunch in in a week. And obviously diving on the Great Lakes is a crapshoot weather-wise. I mean, I've gone on trips where we've been weathered off the whole trip and, and it's just, you know, a lot of money and a lot of miles for nothing, but that's, that's the name of the game. That's the way the ball bounces. So you kind of deal with it. So um, yeah, the next one, it doesn't matter to me as long as it's, as long as it's uh, underwater and it's a board pile, I'll be there. Okay. Here's the la the final question at your level of diving and photography. This is from Rolf. Does diving with the camera sometimes distract you from really taking in the wreck because you are photography focused or do you feel like it focuses you on taking in the wreck more? Absolutely phenomenal question. I don't believe anybody's ever asked me that. And it's so pertinent. You're absolutely right. It completely distracts me from the dive. I've had this talk with many of my other photographer friends, such as uh, Steve and Dirk. You come back from the dive and you have to look at the photographs on your computer because you spent the entire dive looking through a viewfinder, framing for composition and making sure things were on focus lock that you never really enjoyed the dive. That's why I said I almost always dive with my camera. Occasionally, if I've been on a wreck multiple times, I don't bother taking it. Uh, or occasionally, if it's the last dive of the trip, I'll just leave it on the boat because I want to just go enjoy a dive like I used to before I shot underwater. But yeah, no, it, it completely steals your focus. Great question. Thank you for asking. Well, and I think that that's pretty much it. Unless, Morgan, you see anything else on Facebook, we've got a lot of nice thank yous and great comments. Yeah, there's no, there's no more questions, but everyone's very appreciative and said that this has been a great program. So thank you. Thank you to all of you for your hard work for putting this together. And thanks for everybody joining us. It's been great fun. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Cal. And they could go to calsworld.net to get a hold of you, or you can visit... Um, the Door County Library website or the Crest Pavilion website for a copy of this video afterwards. Thank you so much. Be well, everyone. Thank you.